ready to YouTube. I will click on go now. Yes, you can start. Sir, we are in go live, sir. Yes, sir, please start. Yeah. That thrives on a robust research and development program. 21 years of expertise in pharmaceutical, 25 plus state of art manufacturing facilities, presence in more than 120 countries, 51, 15,000 plus employees across the globe, 200 plus products in portfolio. Hetero Research Foundation started as early as in the year 1995, spearheaded by more than 500 top notch scientists, excellence in developing generics, difficult to make and complex APIs, novel drug delivery system, new chemical entities and biosimilars. Hetero Healthcare is one of the world leaders in developing and manufacturing a wide range of brands in various therapy segments, including gastroenterology and hepatology. More than three decades of experience in manufacturing and marketing pharmaceuticals. Hetero Healthcare has also been in forefront pro providing drugs for COVID-19 pandemic, such as COI4 injection, that is Remdesivir, and Favir tablets, that is Favipiravir. Hetero Gastrocare is committed towards creating awareness about hepatitis B and C, along with products like Heptivite, providing access to high quality medicines at affordable rates and enriching lives of patients for better well-being. Adding to the portfolio, we are pleased to introduce Midohep, a brand of midodrine hydrochloride, a vasoconstrictor being widely used in orthostatic hypotension and various secondary hypertensive disorders. It has been recently shown to have a significant improvement in cirrhotic patients with ascites. For further detailed discussion on this topic in our today's webinar, that is novel advances in the management of refractory ascites and HRS, I would like to introduce our moderator and speaker. I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Arun Aris, sir. Arun Aris, sir, is a senior consultant in Gastro at Madras Medical Mission, Chennai. Uh, Arun Aris, sir, has completed his MBBS in Christian Medical College, Bello, MD General Medicine at Government Medical College, Mysore, and DM Gastroenterology in Christian Medical College, Bello, and additional qualifications, research ethics and good clinical practice cmc value international us training university of alabama usa advanced international us observships in aig hyderabad hands on training in third space endoscopy esd poem mumbai strettta hands on training aig hyderabad endoscopic suturing hands on bids mumbai reputation and practice management i am amdabad sir is currently designated a senior consultant gastroenterologist in Institute of Gastroenterology and Liver Disease, Madras Medical Mission, Chennai. And sir has got some great academic achievements, that is uh, SSLC state rank holder, ninth, merit scholarship awardee for first and second year MBBS, first certificate of honor for pharmacology and forensic medicine, college topper for MD general medicine, first prize for poster presentation in the category of nutrition at ISG Con 2010. Membership in professional bodies like ISG, INSL, SGEI, AAG, ACG and EASL. And today we have our eminent guest speaker, Dr. N. Arun sir, Assistant Professor of Gastroenterology, Department of Digestive Health and Diseases, Chennai, Visiting Consultant at uh, Bilroth Hospital, Chennai, and Director, Chandra Gastro Liver Clinic and Endoscopic Center, Chennai, Area of Interest, Post Liver Transplant Immunosuppressive Guidelines, Plasma Pheresis in ACLF, and Life Member for ISG, INSL, SGEI, and IAP. And uh, I have a great pleasure in having uh, two eminent uh, faculties here on this uh, webinar. Uh, I, I would like to uh, request and hand over the session to our moderator, Dr. R.S. Arun, sir. R.S. Arun, sir, please, sir. Good evening uh, to one and all. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Arun, who is a young, enterprising, interventional gastroenterologist rising to prominence in Chennai. He is very lively, pleasant, and uh, uh, interactive, and very knowledgeable in various disciplines of gastroenterology. So it will be a wonderful session wherein uh, he will enlighten us mm -hmm. about the novel advances of uh, management in refractory ascites and uh, hepatorenal syndrome. So uh, it is my, uh, uh, I also, um, would like to acknowledge the effort Hetero team has put in to organize this uh, webinar. And I welcome all particip uh, participants uh, for an hour of uh, uh, 
um, academic discussion on gastroenterology. Yes. Dr. Arun, please. Thank you, Dr. Arun, sir, for a very brief introduction. It's really, really a great pleasure for me to be along with you, sir. This is the first time I'm joining with you in this forum, in this great, uh, in this, uh, during this pandemic and in this uh, dawning hours of this Sunday, uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to join along with you, sir. And one word, you are a very good senior to me, and uh, through you, we came to know about many things, sir. So, uh, as a consultant, a senior consultant in Tribunal Hospital, it's really a great pleasure for me to have you today in this session, sir. And moreover, I also would like to thank Etroforma to give you the opportunity to share some knowledge about what's happening in refractory ascites and epitorenal syndrome. And I welcome all the delegates who have been participating here, so, so senior consultants and friends, to discuss something about the novel advances in the management of refractory ascites and epitorenal syndrome. So directly, we are going to enter the discussion. So what's the brief, see why we are chosen this topic, that's the most important thing for me to discuss right now. So because, uh, See, daily, day in and day out, in our routine practice, we have been getting frequently about a cirrhotic patient. If the patient is going to be cirrhotic, sometimes the patient will be compensated, sometimes the patient will be decompensated. Once the patient is going for decompensatory phase, once the patient is going for end-stage liver disease, what's the problem is going to set in the patient mind may develop ascites. But only many of the practitioners, even the general physicians, some surgeons, or even the leading gastroenterology, so many other consultants are being managing this kind of I mean, uh, scenario frequently. But when we are going to do this management, how is it possible? How is it possible? I mean, in what way you're going to monitor? How do you going to titrate the dose? Uh, what is the initial regimen you're going to start? Or what are the various complications you are going to anticipate in the case of ascites? Once the patients develop uh, multiple other complications, how are you going to manage? These are all the various areas that I'm going to brush your knowledge right now in this area of discussion. See, to discuss into about cirrhosis, as we all know that it's nothing but the complete distortion of the liver, the hepatic architecture is going to go down. And apart from that, and there will be a formation of regenerative nodules which will be most of the time will be irreversible so in early stages nowadays but even then some uh, some evidence of cirrhosis even because of alcohol and other things uh, there is some evidence show that the cirrhosis is still reversible at some point of time but most of the time it will be irreversible at the time of presentation so once the patient is going for cirrhosis as we all know that the various etiology in india if you're going to look alcoholic liver disease is one most common entity frequently will be doing even males and females we have been getting many of alcoholic liver disease case reports have been there apart from that Viral hepatitis, as we all know that the chronicity because of B as well as C and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is more common in the West nowadays is even rising up in the Indian population other scenario. These are all the major area of, uh, apart from the, the multiple other major etiological factor for cirrhosis, that's not uh, in the area of discussion right now. So all the natural history of cirrhosis which you're going to believe because based upon the various etiology and various factors. And if you're going to take a normal liver, for, just for an example, I'm giving you a scenario. If the patient has severe other infection, the patient can go for chronicity. Once the patient can go for chronicity, or 20 to 30% of the patients can go for cirrhosis. Uh, once the patient is going to cirrhosis, there is around one to 5% of the population can go for hepatosolocosin, one of the most dreadful complications that may be anticipated at around 20 to 30 years after the initial presentation. So this is a various complications. So if you are going to look, that's the basic definition about compensated and decompensated. The patient doesn't develop ascites. The patient doesn't develop any evidence of hepatic end curve. The patient doesn't develop any evidence of coagulopathy or other major complications. But once the patient is going for decompensation, as we all know, right from the basic knowledge that ascites is very bleed, and sometimes the patient will be worsening of bilirubin as well as the patient can develop a uh, hepatic coma, nothing but hepatic end self. So. This is how the progression of cirrhosis is going to set in. See, if the stage one, two, and three, and four, as per the ESC statement, what they mentioned that if the patient in stage one is compensated with no evidence of esophageal viruses, with that shows evidence of mortality or one person, but as the patient, if the patient is going to develop evidence of viruses, it shows evidence of mortality around 3.4 percent. Once the patient gets decomposited, it means the patient falls into the category C, I mean, stage three and four. The patient can develop ascites, the patient can develop the massive GI bleed, which in which the scenario, the mortality rate will be going almost around more than 50 percent each. So the major complications as well, right now, right from the basics, any bleed, hepatoportal, hepatorenal, or spontaneous major infections can set in, or the cardiovascular disturbance, or the patients have neurological issues. Sometimes the hepatocellular malignancy can supervene. Also the thrombotic, because also, always you should remember the cirrhotic is a procoagulant state, that is evidence of thrombosis can be predisposed in various other pathologies. So 
to discuss about this scenario of refractory ascites before switching over that so we will take a brief case snippet uh, and so this is this is how we uh, frequently we are approaching so in your routine practice if you're going to get a male of around 50 years who is who's going to present you with history of nash related cirrhosis with history of decomposition in the form of ascites and is male so male is nothing but bilirubinine or creatinine if you're going to take into account is male sodium if it is going to be more than 22 and in many centers, they'll be doing parasynthesis. So some centers they'll be doing frequent large volume parasynthesis. So if the patient is going to present with you evidence of large volume parasynthesis, which is nothing but removal of around approximately five liters of fluid at one point of sitting, if you're going to do large volume parasynthesis, so what is going to happen if you're going to put the dilation on diuretics, sometimes what will happen, the patient will have worsening of creatinine. The normal creatinine will be worsening because of the, we are not very sure whether it's because of diuretic related complication or anything else which is being supermain in this presentation. So. Uh, for example, the creatinine value will be going around 1.5 to 1.8, but the BP is still in the lowest center of 90 by 60 with evidence of pedal edema. In this scenario, with evidence of large volume parasynthesis, with worsening of creatinine, if the patient is on diuretic, how are you going to approach this kind of patient? How are you going to proceed with this kind of patients? So to discuss about that, always you should remember that a transition from compensated to decompensated cirrhosis in any population because of any other etiology can progress at the rate of around 5 to 7 percentage per year. But if you're going to see that the initial, what I've been discussing, if you want to analyze all this pathology, you need to see the liver stiffness measurement by fibro scan and other things which is being available right now. In many centers, also we need to measure the HVPG gradient. So always if the HVPG gradient, it should be more than five. I mean, if it is going to be more than five and if it is going to be less than 10, it should be around stage zero. And if the HVPG, if it is going to be more than 10 and liver stiffness, if it is going to be more than 20, it is stage one and stage two is almost equivalent to that. But once the patient is going for the decomposition, so that there's what has been discussed, C3, 4, and 5, the patient is going for a further late decomposition phase. That's nothing but stage 6, in which the patient is going for refractory acidase, persistent portal system, and calf. And sometimes the patient will have worsening of jaundice, infections will supervain, and multi organ dysfunction. And finally, this will predispose to ACL, chronic liver failure can occur, and which leads to the death. So always we need to take care, once the patient, we need to prevent the progression of this kind of scenario to set in. So this is about the brief analysis, what's happening about the median survival in this kind of patient, that multi-stage model for the clinical course of cirrhosis. And if you're going to look into the compensated and decompensated, in the patient's asymptomatic, the survival is approximately 12 years. Once a patient is going for decompensated phase, the survival is going to come around one to two years. So that's what I've been discussing with you. So if you're going to ask us about the pathophysiology of portal hypertension, it's a very interesting area because portal hypertension ascites is the most important thing to be discussed in this management. So what is going to happen in liver cirrhosis? Once the liver architecture is going to completely distorted, so there will be evidence of fibrosis, which will predispose to portal hypertension, intrahepatic pressure, and everything is going to get climb up. So there will be sheer stress will be there, and the vasodilatory pathway is going to get triggered out. Once the vasodilatory pathway if it is going to get triggered or what's happened, there will be the nitric oxide release. That's the most important thing, vasodilatory activation, which is being, uh, I mean, uh, uh, frequently encoded nowadays. So we'll nitric oxide release, and which will predispose to mesenteric angiogenesis, and which will predispose to hyporesponsiveness to various vasoconstriction therapy. If you're going to think about various vasoconstriction, there will not be any response to that various vasoconstriction therapy, which will predispose to splanctin vasodilatation, and this will increase the splanctin capillary filling pressure, and this will predispose to arterial under filling and will cause evidence of ascites. Though it will be evidence of uh, uh, sodium retention and other things which will predispose to ascetic formation. See, the systemic, the major thing what we are going to do is increase, I mean the, the systemic vasodilation, the splanchnic vasodilatation process along with renal vasoconstriction if the patient is going for NCA liver disease along with if the patient is going to develop HRS and other complications. So this kind of presentation will be leading you to multiple vasoconstrictive pathways and will be releasing antinatrodepiptide and and all other things which will predispose to multi other complications that I in slides. This is about the brief, this is briefly about the pathophysiology of portal hypertension, all the acid is on arterial overfilling. As you all know, that the <coughs> The increase osmotic pressure and ready, I mean, uh, I mean, low osmotic and ready, increase hydrostatic pressure, which will predispose to acidic formation, is the most important thing to be conveyed right now. So, 
So if you're going to look into the slide, if the patient is having any minimal evidence of ascites in this background, uh, if the patient is going to present with mild elevation of renal function, and doesn't mean that the patient is going for HRS. Always you should remember that HRS is a final diagnosis, which in previous was mostly at the hinge stage liver disease. Always don't think that once a minimal elevation of creatinine is there, don't label the patient immediately as HRS. That's one important thing I want to convey to you. And see, initial phase will be portal hypertensive in the background of ascites. Once the patient is being initiated with diuretic therapy because of splanchnic vasodilation the patients uh, and finally the patient can go for renal vasoconstriction that will predispose to epidural syndrome as the day goes on so this is about uh, the same slide what I will discuss. So this is over the natural history of ascites. The HVPG, if it is going to be less than 10, and if it is going to be more than 10 with moderate vasodilatation, uh, severe vasodilatation, if the HVPG, if it is going to be more than 10, and extreme vasodilatation, that will predispose to. So portal hypertension to no ascites, uncomplicated ascites, finally to refractory, and once again, late stages, the patient can go for epidurinal syndrome, which is nothing but the phenotypic renal dysfunction in the background of cirrhosis. So. In this scenario, so the most important area for me to discuss today is the, how are you going to approach a patient with ascites and how are you going to tackle a patient with refractory ascites? So before switching on my area to refractory ascites, a brief analysis, brief statement about how do you target your ascites, how to control your ascites? Because when you're going to present with any fluid in the blood, it doesn't mean it's only because of liver, it could be because of multiple other etiologies. We are well known, always we need to look for the cause, we need to look for the SAD. We can see the acidic albumin gradient. If the serum acidic albumin gradient, if it is going to be more than 1.1, that shows the evidence of portal hypertension in more than 95% of the patients. And we need to see if the serum acidic albumin acid is or whether it's low sac, low sac because of multiple other etiology tuberculosis are there, multiple other things we need to consider. And ICSAC acid is nothing but we can, based upon the etiology, it could be viral, it could be because of alcoholic. Always in this scenario, we need to eliminate the predominant focus. First, what is the trigger? We need to identify the triggering factor. What is the thing which is going to precipitate this event? And next to that, first thing we need to idea that make sure that the patient is going to be adequate salt restriction. To discuss about that, I will join with you. I will, I will, I mean, I will, I will be taking all those things in my upcoming slides. And salt restriction and diuretics has to be enhanced. And we need to look for the precipitating factors like uh, GI bleed, or if the patient is having any nitrogenous and non-nitrogenous precipitating factors, or if the patient is having evidence of HCC, or if the patient is having any drug abuse, like evidence of any usage of any, I um, mean, you know, AC inhibitors or usage of any NSAID, so many other things. Always the first step in the management of acid is you need to make sure that the patient should be on adequate salt restriction. That's the most important thing we need to take care of. Once the patient is on adequate salt restriction, that itself will be taken care of. Once the patient is having adequate salt restriction, there will be significant weight loss of at least around 0.5 kg, I mean, 0.5 grams per day. I mean, uh, that's the most important thing. If you're going to uh, have adequate, I mean, 0.5 kg per day, uh, if the sodium intake, if it is going to be around 5.2 grams of salt per day, initially it was given around uh, which is almost equal to 2,000 milligrams. So low salt diet alone will be eliminating your ascites in around 10% of the population. So the first thing, eliminate your salt, the low salt diet. So how to recognize your salt restriction is being done in a proper manner that I'll be discussing. And once a patient, always you need to choose a diuretic therapy. Always when you're going to, you need to choose a potassium spiring diuretic. The first one, the aldosterone antagonist, the spinal lactone can be taken. And if you're going to take spinal lactone, always you need to combine with a loop diuretic like Fusamin or Tosmin, what you going to use and when you're going to use a diuretic the ideal the combination of two diuretic either you need to start from 40 milligrams of fluzamate along with under i mean under billions of spinal lactone can be started off in the management of ascites uh so because why do we uh, why do we combine the diuretic because we will be acting on two different sides loop different loop diuretic will be acting on the sodium potassium pathway and and uh, so, I mean, uh potassium spinal diuretic will be acting on the distalitic tubule and all these things will be so the contracting effect of hyperkalemia and other complications definitely will going to be controlled if you're going to use two uh, diuretics simultaneously. Some adverse effects have been reported as well known gynecomastia and other things. And if this nothing works off, if the patient is developing other complications can be, we can add other diuretics like amyloride. But so the baseline diuretic dose will be 40 of fruzamine and it will be up to uh, spinal lactone around uh, 100 milligrams. If this nothing works off, we can step up the diuretic slowly and we can go up to um, uh, 160 milligrams of fluzomide, and we can also go up to uh, 400 milligrams of uh, spinal lactone. But how frequently we are going up to this dose, that's a questionable issue to be discussed. See, once a patient, this is a very important thing to be discussed right now. 
So you are going to start the patient on diuretic. That's most of the person, most of the doctor, most of the counselor will be doing that. But once the patient is going to be on sodium, I mean, diuretic support, how are you going to assess whether there's diuretic response? You need to take it of the urinase sodium potassium ratio. It has to be more than one. So I want to see that. So always you should remember that if the patient is going to be at adequate salt restriction, which means around 88 millimoles per day of adequate salt restriction, there will be loss of around 78 and non-urinary losses of around approximately 10 millimoles. So if the patient is having adequate urinary sodium excretion, we need to target around more than 78 millimoles per day. So if the patient has adequate salt restriction alone without any diuretics, which means uh, the urinary sodium excretion uh, will be less. And uh, suppose if you're going to add the patient with diuretic support with adequate salt restriction, so what are going to happen? So the, once the patient has been diuretic responsive, the patient will have uh, reduction of weight as beyond 0.5 grams per day. I mean, so the, the definite significant weight loss will be that, along with evidence of, I um, mean, urinary sodium excretion will be more than 78 millimoles. Suppose if the patient urinary sodium excretion uh, if it is not going to be more than 78 millimoles, and if the patient is having evidence of volume mobile, which means the diuretic resistant phase, the diuretic is not responding to the patient. And uh, these are all the scenarios you should analyze uh, before switching over the diuretic therapy. And we need to target a urinary sodium potassium excretion should be more than, uh, I mean, uh, I mean uh, more than one that has to be targeted if you're going to manage a diuretic. So sometimes if there is no response, we can step up the dose of diuretic after three days uh, based upon the uh, clinical uh, spectrum. So our main area for discussion is nothing but refractory ascites. If you want to say refractory ascites, so even after large volume of paracentesis, even after the maximum dose of diuretics, if it is not going to be respond, or if there is a residue in ascites, if it is going to recur again and again, or the early recurrence, so this is nothing but refractory ascites. If you are going to categorize the refractory ascites, the multiple definitions for that, but one thing, the major, major classification is nothing but diuretic resistant and diuretic intractable. So what do you mean by diuretic resistant? You are going to give a maximum dose and it doesn't going to respond, nothing but diuretic resistant. What is a diuretic intractable? Even after giving a maximum dose of diuresis, you are beginning, yeah, yeah. You, sometimes you, even if the minimal dose of diuresis, you'll be, you be getting other complications because of diuretics. You may getting uh, electrolyte disturbances, you may getting other complications because of the, the diuretic intractable complications. So you need to stop the dose, stop diuretic because of that. So we cannot able to mobilize the acid. So that's nothing but diuretic intractable. So this is a basic definition about this refractory ascites. As we all know that uh, at least one week of uh, diuretic therapy on adequate salt restriction around 90 millimoles per day, that is the most important thing to be taken care of for cone. And ne next to that, and when you say there is no response means mean weight loss of at least 0.8 kg over four days and the urinary sodium output less than sodium intake. That's what we've discussed with you. And early ascites recurrence means uh, recurrence of grade two or three, which means the patient is having uh, within four weeks of initial mobilization. If you're going to do a paracentesis and within four weeks, again, the patient is having recurrent of recurrence of grade two and three acid, which means there is early ascetic recurrence. So as we all know, the diuretic can predispose to multiple complications. It can predispose to renal impairment, Hepatic end cap, hyponatremia, hypohyperkalemia, and incapacitating muscle cramps can occur. So always you should remember that renal impairment is increased creatinine by more than 100% to value of more than two milligrams per deciliter, and hyponatremia of the serum sodium is going to less than 125 millimoles, and hypohyperkalemia based upon the clinical presentation. This is this is the same thing what I've been discussed. So we need to target the urinary sodium potassium excretion of more than one along with. Uh, I mean, urinary sodium loss should be more than uh, 70 millimoles if the patient is going to be diuretic sensitive. And how are you going to manage the patient with refractory ascites? So once a patient being diagnosed with refractory ascites, uh, it could be because of multiple modalities of treatment can try. Uh, it could be medical therapy. It could be because of large volume parasynthesis. You can go for tips, nothing but transjugular intrahepatic portal system shunt. And finally, we can go for liver transplant and other new modalities and palliative support is being available right now in the market to tackle this ascites. And what is the initial treatment for this refractory acid? We need to eliminate the harmful source. So we need to eliminate the precipitating factor. Suppose if the patient is on any EAC inhibitors or the drugs or NSAIDs, we need to stop that. And always, if you're going to manage a patient with ascites, you need to target the MAP, not the mean artery pressure. If you are going to target, see, always you should remember that some patient with cirrhosis if in the patient of a um, in decomposited phase, the, the usual MAP will be around 50 to 55. And you need to target the MAP. It should be at least around 10 millimeters 
of mercury from the baseline. So we need to target at least around 60 to 65 for this kind of patients to improve the clinical scenario. Once the map, everything is going to attain in a proper manner, which means if the map, uh, if it is going to be more than 82 in this scenario, what they have been around 70% chance of survival for more than two years. And those uh, with the map of around less than 82, uh, there are multiple studies I mentioned, the 20%, the, the chances of survival will be coming down to approximately 20% of the period of survival. So, AC inhibitors and ARB is what's going to happen in this country if you're going to use along with this thing, which means it will be decreasing, it will decrease the map and also block the production of compulsory vasoconstrictors. So always, you when you're going to manage a patient with ascites, target the map and improve the map more than 10 millimeters of mercury over the baseline. So those things, basic things that should be taken care of when you're going to manage a patient with refractory ascites and other complications. So, so next to that, always any patients to ensure that the low salt diet, low salt diet, as I discussed with you, 2,000 milligrams per day, and no added salt, no added salt, and diuretic should be discontinued permanent in patients. Suppose if the patient is going to develop a diuretic in these complications like hepatic and care for renal impairment, and uh, it can continue only when the urine sodium, if it is greater greater than 30 millimoles per day. And this is another interesting area to discuss about that the role of beta blockers in selected patients with refractory acid. So there are multiple issues, multiple discussion, even for the within this, uh, within this statement uh, and uh, from BJ Chandigarh, they are given multiple papers for that. And uh, IBA has also done multiple studies for that. So what they may mention in that, so we can always try to the dose at the lower dose because once you're going to stop the beta blocker completely, suppose if the patient is having hypertension, so in this, we have taken a clinical scenario of around 90 by 60 BP. So if the patient is being hypertension, doesn't mean you need to stop the beta blocker completely. So you can you can go for the lower dose of beta blockers, like propranolol, if you're going to take, for example, you can give around 20 milligrams. So rather than, because COVID alone, most of the time will be having additional vasodilatory because alpha it's also having a alpha property. So COVID alone sometimes will not be used in this kind of scenario. And you can go for a lower dose of propranolol because only when you're going to give a lower dose of propranolol, you're going to take a huge GA bleed. The prophylaxis for upper GA bleed will be strongly ensure. And next to that, if you're going to give a lower dose of propranolol, the prevention of subacute back to the I mean, uh, uh, Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis will be more, and uh, these things to prevent all these infection and other complications. Always, you should not stop the beta blockers completely, as with the various school uh, of concepts what's been going on right now. So we can give a lower dose of propanol, and uh, as for the Berino six state, what they've been given, the doses of the beta blockers can be completely, I mean, uh, uh, can be easily reduced in if the patient is having BP, if it is going to be less than ninety. And if the serum creatinine, if it is going to be more than 1.5, and if the patient is having hyponatremia, if it is going to be less than 130, so the non-selective beta blockers in this entity can be reduced. And now the most important area for us for the joint, the topic of the day is nothing but oral metodrain. So if you're going to think about this oral metodrain, it's nothing but it's a oral vasopressor. It's an agonist. It's a very simple mechanism of action. So what is going to happen? It will going to increase the blood pressure and it's going to improve your map and you're going to, and when you know, the base always the initial presentation we are going to use for orthostatic hypertension. And also in case of cirrhosis, the role of uh, even in case of diuretic resistant ascites, uh, there is significant evidence of, uh, to show that there is a potential role for this metodine to take over. So basic pharmacology about this metodine, as we all know that uh, it's uh, off-life, it, it's a metabolite. The metabolic process is a desglymetodine and the off-life will be around three to four hours approximately. And uh, it metabolized by the liver into T metabolism, that's what we discussed. And predominantly it's uh, uh, been cleared by active renal secretion. So this metodine will be converted to desglymetodine and once the pro-drug pro is being formed, it's being strong, potent alpha agonist. Alpha agonist. So alpha agonist will, what's going to happen? The, the patient will be having the basic pathophysiology of splanchnic vasodilation will be taken over. So there will be splanchnic vasoconstriction, which will increase the vascular tone and elevation of blood pressure, and will improve the systemic circulation. And once the systemic circulation is going to improve, there will be improvement of your renal function and increased sodium and water excretion, which will reduce your ascites in this kind of presentation. So you should know to whom we are subject in, what are the conditions uh, when the once uh, when the patient is being subjected to metodrine, how are you going to assess the dose? What is the titration guidelines? These things have to be targeted if you're going to subject the patient with metodrine. And 
So there are multiple school of thoughts for discussion and multiple studies, multiple papers are being done for uh, uh, various dosage, dosage regimen for midodrine. And right now, most of the time I'll be giving up initially around five milligrams GDS, and sometimes we can go up to seven milligram. And there are some papers even uh, some point five and there are some papers even up to 17.5 milligrams twice daily have been fried and some papers even up to 12.5 milligrams twice daily been fried. There are multiple papers to quote for that. But so always we need to see, we need to assess a map, we need to target the baseline map should be more than 10 milligrams over the baseline levels once you're going to start the patient with middle drain and uh, uh that's the main thing and 2.5 milligram of uh, incremental of dose we can try along with that so we can take at around three to four hourly interval predominantly in the morning or in the midday or at least for four hours before bedtime to prevent evidence of uh, uh, supine hypertension and other complications hypertension and other complications to set it this is a very interesting paper from PGI, Professor Virenga Group. And what they've been done in that, if you're going to take a standard medical treatment along with that, if you're going in 40 serotic patients, if you're going to take middle drain, so the standard medical therapy with middle drain, what they've been given that, if the patient is going to be on middle drain support for around 7.5 million, they have taken a 7.5 million thrice daily. So what is that standard medical therapy, which means a sodium restriction, I mean, adequate salt restriction, along with you are going to subject the patient with diuretics, along with the repeated large volume paracentesis with evidence of albumin support. So albumin one gram per kg of albumin support, which will, or we are going to analyze the outcome, control of as it is. So what they've been given, rather than going only for the standard medical therapy, if you are going to add midodrine to this group, there is significant potential benefit in improving the map in this kind of population. So oral midodrine, this is another paper which has been taken from ASLD portion statement. Oral midodrine, what has been given to shown improved clinical outcomes and survival in patients with refractory acid is its use being considered reasonably. So it is going to improve the urine volume, urine sodium, and mean artery pressure and time survival, other things. This is another paper from PGA, what has been taken so in non-acidemia, so in non-acidemic patients with cirrhosis, with or without acidity, they have been analyzed steady. If you're going to use a short-term use of metodrine, what's going to be comparing with a renal hemodynamic as well as a systemic hemodynamic? So renal hemodynamics, uh, like um, in uh, uh, urine excretion of sodium and other things, apart from the systemic hemodynamics, like uh, mean artery pressure, everything is going to be significantly elevated in this uh, paper. If you're going to use in non-acidemic patients for a period of around seven days, if you're going to use middle drain. So uh, this is about the hormonal measurement. This is another paper from General of Hepatology. And what I mean to measure the hormonal assessment. Suppose uh, in this study, what have been taken uh, after three years, first three years of middle drain administration, well, uh, they have proven that there is a significant elevation of MAP and systemic vascular resistance and a significant, I mean, uh, uh, these things are being analyzed over the three hour period. And uh, so there will be significant MAP elevation in SPR has been proven once the patient is going to be used with the um, metadrine and the other things. So, so what they've been analyzed about the hormonal levels, if you're going to administer metadrine for a longer duration, that shows evidence of marked decrease in plasma renin activity. So if you're going to, why we are taking this plasma renin activity? Because the PRA is one most important thing to analyze if the patient is going for PHCD, nothing but paracentesis induced succulative dysfunction. So if the patient is going for repeated large volume paracentesis, the patient can go for PICD and other complication. Once this kind of complication sets in, the PRA levels will be going more than four nanograms. Those things I'll be checking over in the upcoming slides. But if you're going to use this middle drain, there is evidence that the market decrease in PRA and nitric oxide is a potential vasodilators and also in the plasma level of ADH. But that doesn't mean that there is no significant change in the level of adenatriotic peptide AMP or in the level of plasma androsterone levels if you're going to use middle drain for a shorter duration of period. Uh, this is another paper, uh, what they've been taken into account, if you're going to combine this midodrine versus octreotide. So what they mentioned in that, both midodrine and octreotide can reduce the plasma renin activity, but renin, but midodrine can reduce PRA and increase significantly GFR, more potently than octreotide, if you are going to use. So it shows that evidence of midodrine is having a significant beneficial role in the management of refractory acidities. This is by Professor Virendra Singh and uh, group, and what they've been done, so because most of the studies from uh, PGH uh, trying to for management of refractory acidities have been done, uh, apart from IRBS. And uh, so what they've been done, they have been taken uh, metodrine around 7.5 milligrams and uh, uh, clonidine around 0.1 milligrams. So being given a titration. So, uh, and uh, around 60 patients, they've been taken with evidence of refractory acidities. In this, what they've been proven that, 
Midodrine and combination of midodrine plus clonidine or plus standard medical therapy will always prove that the superior to standard medical therapy alone, but no superiority of combination over midodrine alone has been documented. This is another thing about tolvaptin, briefly about, if you're thinking about tolvaptin, you can go around 7.5. What is this tolvaptin? It's nothing but the vasopressin naturopanase. So what's going to happen if you're going to give, it will be predominantly, the vaptans is going to look at predominantly, so vasopressin uh, will be predominantly located in the V2 receptors and will be acting on the aquaparin channels, which will improve the sodium excretion and which will improve the sodium I mean, elimination other things. So uh, so once you're subjecting the patient with uh, uh, water excretion, other process to stretch, in. So if you're going to subject the patient with tolvapt and always there is some evidence of black box warning when you're going to use tolvapt and other things. But in this paper uh, from 2017 journal, what we mentioned that uh, midodrine and tolvapt and if you're going to use, uh, there is significant benefit at around one month and three month period rather than combine rather than giving uh, either midodrine or tolvapt alone uh, in improving uh, in improving the mean out pressure and other things. So. So that's what the V2 receptor antagonist is predominantly the uh, vaptans will be acting in the distal tubule and to increase the solute free I mean, water excretion. And there are multiple studies being proven that there is some evidence to think in terms if you're going to combine uh, midodrine and tolvaptan. So uh, this is another paper. What they may ask is first, first month, second month, I mean, third month and sixth month, they have been looking into uh, the role of midodrine. Uh, in this, they have been categorizing the patient with complete response or partial response or no, I mean, absence of response or no response. So what do you mean by this complete response, which means the completely elimination of ascites and partial response, which means the presence of acid is not requiring parasynthesis, but absence of response means the presence of ascites, which will make you to, I mean, uh, which, in which the patient requires frequent parasynthesis. So they have been taken into the account. So what have been see at month one and month three and month six, they have been did the study and they have shown a reasonable good response if you're going to use midodrine in this. So uh, about midodrine, it's nothing, so what is the major mechanism of action? It's nothing but it will predominantly improve on math. That's the most important thing to be targeted. About 10 millimeter of mercury over the baseline lower. And next to that, the cardiac output is going to come down and systemic vascular resistance is going to increase and urinary output and urinary sodium excretion will be increased, which will reduce the ascites and plasma renin activity is going to come down, which will improve the complications of PICD and no renal or hepatic dysfunction being reported uh, in various studies being shown over. And this is another paper being taken over, but nothing much discussed in this slide. Now long, if you're going to think about midodrine, if you're going to combine with the rifaximin, always in the background of rifaximin, you're going to give a cheat for a, to prevention of hepatic and for other complications. Most of the time, the back uh, composite, decomposite, the zeros you are going to use. And if you're going to use rifaximin and uh, midodrine, that shows some clinical outcome. There should be some uh, improvement, improvement in renal hemodynamics and short-term survival has been reported, but uh, these studies are still need to be more validated from that in the management of refractory ascites. So the most important thing is the midodrine plus albumin for prevention from uh, prevention of ascites in the background of cirrhosis who are waiting liver transplant. It's a very interesting paper from Journal of Hepatology in December 2018 been taken over. So what's the main thing they've been taken over that if you're going to use midodrine and albumin in patients who are undergoing large volume parasynthesis, what they've been giving, mentioning that you need to use a longer duration of midodrine rather than you going for a shorter duration. So if you're going to use for a longer duration, there is definitely improvement of hyponatremia, there is definitely improvement of renal impairment, all these things, uh, I mean, uh, in the renal perfusion, other things will be improved. If you're going to use midodrine with versus albumin, and albumin also has my answer trail that I'm discussing in my upcoming slide for continuous uh, frequent long dose of, I mean, uh, uh, long-term albumin support also to be done in the management of refractory ascites. So, uh, brushing out about what's the main thing about, uh, see the key main pathology for refractory ascites is mainly because of uh, solid water, I mean, uh, sodium retention and water retention. Apart from that, the compensatory mechanism is not going to work out. And once the compensatory mechanism fails, the vasoconstrictor and other pathways is going to supervene. So all these things to be act, taken over either by midodrine or other combinations along with dietary restriction. This is a major area to be discussed. And midodrine plus albumin will always have a significant direction of venin running as well as in all the external levels. But uh, so over midodrine plus admin did not prevent the major complications or did not improve the overall survival when you're going to compare with multiple papers or other trials to go on. So 
Uh, final outcome is metoprolin is non inferior to albumin infusion in terms of maintaining renal function, serum sodium, and 24 hour urinary sodium excretion, and no difference in mortality between the groups. And long term intake of metoprolin is more useful rather than short duration of support. So, apart from the role of metoprolin as the medical line of therapy, there are other modalities like large volume parasynthesis and tips and liver transplant that's all been discussed. As we all know, that large volume parasynthesis, what's going to happen if you're going to remove frequently five liters? It's not more cumbersome, it's very difficult. That's why we are going to add metoprolin, albumin support, we need to target the map and other things. So, if you're going to do all these things in a proper manner, the BP and other things will be targeted. And apart from that, the clinical picture definitely is going to improve and the large volume parasynthesis definitely will going to come down rather than doing once in two weeks, definitely. I have seen some many patients, uh, in our city we've been experiencing many patients, if you're going to do, uh, along with metodrine and albumin support, if you're going to give for a lot, uh, longer duration, that shows significant reduction of large volume parasynthesis in these kind of patients along, so large volume, uh, rather than giving frequent, uh, going for a frequent LVP. So, so if you're going for frequent LVP, the most important target, we need to target the spot urine sodium potassium excretion. It should be more than one, which means it indicates a strong pointer to de determine that the 24 hours to the urine sodium excretion is more than 78 millimoles and there is a good response to weight loss and other things. So, and uh, so, uh, so albumin is given predominantly, that's what been, see, for every five liters, so eight grams per liter. So for every five liters of large volume parasynthesis, we need to give albumin support. So around eight grams uh, per liter of uh, to be given if you're going to use albumin. And there are various proportions being a five percent, twenty percent that we frequently see twenty percent albumin support and albumin either infused during or shortly after the parasite. That's the most important thing. If you're going to look at this trend, and uh, uh, sometimes we can combine chili pressing intravenously that one milligram at onset of parasynthesis and one milligram at eight hours. This is another paper being quoted and one milligram at 16 hours. And if you're going to give midodrine, chili pressing and midodrine in the management of refractory acid it may be as effective as albumin because if you're going to see the cost of albumin is very high and apart from the chili pressing next to that and albumin and midodrine is slightly less to that. So uh, if you're going to come combined and Delhi and Midodrine is almost equally effective uh, in the management of refractory acids rather than using albumin alone. So serial parasites will cause sarcopenia, depletion of proteins, malnutrition, and uh, predisposed to multiple infections uh, as BP and other things can supervene. So always, so we need to give albumin in this kind of patients to prevent other complications. This is what about the answer trial, a uh, very interesting thing. And one more trial as that, that I didn't put it in my paper, that's MAC trial. In this, all these things, what been discussed about the long-term effect of human albumin support. See, what they've been done in this study, uh, a 40 gram twice weekly for two weeks and then 40 grams weekly for up to 18 months. So uh, twice weekly, they are giving around 40 grams of albumin support. So what they mean significantly assess in this study, uh, the overall 18 months survival was definitely going to be high. Uh, rather than the standard medical therapy group, if you're going to use this long-term albumin support to prevent uh, frequent parasynthesis and other complications, and also PICD to set in. So briefly about this PICD is nothing but it parasynthesis induced circulatory dysfunction can develop in around 18 to 30 percent of the patients who are going to do a large volume parasynthesis. So what is going to happen mainly is because of multiple neuronal changes as we are well known because of hypovolemia and increased aldosterone activity, ADH activity, and the MAP level, which is going to be reduced, and systemic vascular resistance, which is going to supervene, which will finally predispose to renal perfusion impairment and renal failure is going to set in. So PACD is one of the most important complications and more dreadful complications to be recognized earlier. Usually it will occur at around six days after the parasynthesis. It sometimes remains clinically silent and may not be fully reversible most of the time. So if the patient is having PACD, so there are multiple, so always remember telepresin, albumin, metodrine is having a different role. So what's the role of telepresin versus albumin in parasynthesis induced circulatory dysfunction? They have proven that it definitely is going to improve the renal impairment and telepresin also may be as effective as intravenous albumin in this paper to be quoted off. So, and uh, in this study, if you have been taken over, they have been using uh, check for other various 
alkaloids like uh, albumin, dextrin, polygaline, everything has been taken into account. So for volume expansion, other things. But what they mean finally concluded that albumin alone, which will, uh, to, will prevent the, uh, in this kind of patients, if you're going to use albumin support, and the chances of developing PICD will be only around 10 to 15 percentage, rather than when you're going to use dextrin and other things uh, from around 40 to 50 percent of the patients can go for PICD and polygaline around 40 percent of the patients can go for PICD. These complications can be there. So the predominant thing always to be considered is albumin support in, if you're going to manage a PICD. So Briefly about the other line of management like tips. What's the main thing for tips if you're going to consider and we have been frequently experiencing nowadays early tips because uh, I have seen some patient who presented to us with the evidence of early decomposition phase who may set in with even with moderate to uh, moderate ascites. We are being subjecting the patient for early tips. Always you should remember certain things. What's the tip means nothing but transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt. So you're going to shunt the pathway between the hepatic and the portal two major venous system as going to be taken into account hepatic and portal wine. So there are some complications around hepatic NCAF, minimal hepatic NCAF, some complications around 10 to 20 percent, around 25 percent of the population can be reported even with the strips and other complications can be there. But if you're going to subject the patient early, if you're going to reduce the stent diameter. So if you're going to see there are multiple stent diameters, six millimeter, eight millimeter, 10 millimeter stent diameter there. And if there are new papers, there are many papers to quote that if you're going to reduce the stent diameter to approximately six millimeter, that shows clear evidence. I mean, six to eight millimeter that shows clear evidence that is a definite improvement of this uh, I mean, uh, improvement of hepatic end curve and the reduction of hepatic end curve definitely will be there if you're going to use a reduction I mean, um, in a smaller size stent. And uh, early tips, rather than going for large volume parasynthesis, frequent albumin and other support, early tips definitely is having a strong potential role, but always you should consider tips is only a bridge to liver transplant, but MEL, so MEL scoring was originally developed to predict survival after tips insertion. So, so there are multiple, there are some complications being there because of tips, but early tips placement is one of the most important things sometimes to be considered if, before the patient subjected to liver transplantation. And this is about the brief introduction about the stent placement between the hepatic and the portal venous system. Uh, there are one more new entity, nothing but alpha pumps being used for a longer time, but uh, whether it's available in India, it's not much and uh, very few centers have been tried, but the successful rate, uh, the cost issue is still a questionable thing. So what is it, nothing, what is alpha pump? It's nothing but a peritoneum vesicle shunt, which means um, to the peritoneum, you're going to divert the fluid into your urinary bladder and it will be excreted in the urine. But it is more cumbersome to use this procedure because you need a battery, the battery of life will be very less and uh, you need to be frequent monitoring and some other complications. Sometimes the patient will develop a predominant source of infections, other thing. That's why, and more of the cost is slightly very high and uh, very few centers been tried, but uh, not much of papers been reported. And uh, so in this paper, what's been quoted that by Velo et al, around 40 patients and nine centers were a period. But what they've been mentioned in this, uh, few patients died because of sepsis and few patients because of worsening your liver failure, or renal failure, or undetermined causes being established. So uh, the usage of alpha found in our scenario uh, to divert the fluid from the peritoneum into the urinary bladder. So still more papers to be validated. And these are all other things, other more related like pensional dialysis and pleurex and channel catheter, nothing much to discuss in this area, but these are all other moralities of treatment being available in the management of refractory as it is. And that's the main interest for me to show these slides. So the briefly about the management is, so we need to see, we need to control the ascites. Once the patient is going for refractory ascites, we need to eliminate the sodium, salt restriction, and eliminate all the triggers like alcohol, B and C virus to be treated, to control the hepatitis, uh, check for evidence of hepatitis or carcinoma. If the patient is on beta blockers, whether to stop or give to redu redu reduce dose of beta blockers, and you need to subject the patient with large volume parasitic the with support, and sometimes if the MAP is very low, that's the most important thing to be calculated. We need to improve the MAP to at least 10 millimeter of mercury over the baseline. So we need to use middle drain and sometimes for the patient with tips. If nothing works on patient can be considered for albumin, I mean liver transplant and along with that, see these are all the modalities before liver transplant can be considered and long-term albumin support as per answer trail by Professor uh, PJ statement we can also think of. And, uh, and in this presentation, we always to look for other complications. Once a patient develops ascites like tuberculosis, spontaneous battle peritonitis, we need to look for the salt as you mean, uh, urine sodium potassium excretion, all these things to be taken into account. This is a basic algorithm to manage a patient with refractory ascites. So, next interesting area. 
to discuss epidural syndrome. Uh, uh, so uh, since there is not much of time to discuss more about this, the brief points I'll be taking on the account about epidural syndrome. See, initially there is a one definition by multiple definitions between the KDO and other classification are there. I mean, international club as it is society classification is there. But now the entire definition has been changed over the new nomenclature has been there as per the new that is question state. Now to mention that the HRS one and HRS two is not more now. I mean, no more nowadays. That what been taken over that by HRS AK and HRS non AK. So HRS AK, which means there is absolute increase in creatinine for more than 0.3 millimeter. See, it's nothing but always you should remember that in, it's a it's a phenotypic renal dysfunction in the background of cirrhosis. So. So uh, the patient will not be having a structural pathology most of the time, but there are some papers recently been quoted even in ILBS and other string. What I mean, even in case of acute kidney injury, there is evidence, minimal evidence of structural change. This concept is been changing. So uh, we need more papers to validate all these things. And as per the latest guidelines, as per the world thing, what we what's been available with us. So it's mainly based upon HRS 1 and 2 and HRS AK and HRS non-AK. We need more papers to validate about this statement. And uh, HRS AK is nothing but the creatinine if it is going to be acute kidney, more than 0.3 within 48 hours. And you, and one more entirely, they've been taking urine output if it is going to be less than 0.5 ml per kg body weight for a period of more than six hours. And person increase in serum creatinine more than 50% of the value. Uh, these things have to be taken into an account to consider HRS AK. So if you want to calculate the urine output, that's a strong point to be taken into account. Most of the time, the patient will be in ICU care and you need to catheterize the patient. And with that, we need to calculate all these things. And the second definition is HRS not AK, which means acute kidney. In this, the subdivision will be HRS acute kidney disease and HRS chronic kidney disease. So acute kidney means the duration will be around uh, less than three months. And the chronic kidney means the duration will be more than three months. In this, they're going to calculate the EGFR. EGFR calculation, multiple formulas being available as we well known. And uh, the EGFR, if it is going to be less than 60 for a period of three months, in this the EGFR, if it is going to be less than three, less than, uh, I mean, uh, 60 for a period of less than three months, which means uh, HR is AKD and HR is CKD. Now, so now the two major entities is HRS AK and HRS non AK. In that, AKD and CKD is the most important thing for a period of three months to be taken into account. So, what is the basic fact of physiology for this epidural syndrome? That's what I've been discussing in the initial slide. Once a hepatic architecture gets distorted, this planktonic vasodilatation process, nitric oxide release, as we have discussed, direction of FAT circulating volume, and what's going to happen, the renal vasoconstrictor pathology is going to set in, which will be predisposed to activation of renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, and sympathetic activation, which will make you to uh, go for reduced uh, renal vasodilation and increased vasoconstrictor processes and vasoconstricting practices are going to get released, uh, which will be predisposed to uh, I mean, uh, multiple uh, system involvement. So it may go for cardiac dysfunction, sympathetic activity can go for tachycardia, barrel receptor mechanism activation, and go for ANP, adrenaline peptide release, and sometimes the patient can go for uh, uh, increased renal sodium retention, which will be to a reduction of the I mean, uh, uh, solid free water, and uh, then the patient will be having hyponatremia, which will make the patient to go for reduction of G, I mean, uh, uh, glomerular filtration rate. So this will make you, for the patient, go for uh, epidural syndrome to set in. So, the basic pathology of uh, renal vasoconstriction and splanking vasodilation is the most important thing, along with vasodilatory process to be taken over. And this is a latest topic, I mean, uh, from General of Hepatology, will be taken into from 2018 portion statement, what been given in that. So, uh, it's mainly because of renal hyperperfusion or because of danger signal by inflammation, which will predispose to microvascular dysfunction, or also because of direct tubular damage. Always the non AKA, you should remember that other causes like acute tubular necrosis will always mimic this kind of presentation. And when you are going to tackle this ATN and other presentation, always uh, the entire management process will be different. You need to analyze the acute kidney injury, various markers are there. So many papers are in the urine gall, in gall, so many other papers are there. And uh, these things, so we need to look for the basic urine protein, we need to look for the granular cast to see whether the patient is having acute kidney injury because of non-AKA process, other things. Always the ATN, other things also to be ruled out if you are going to think the manager. Because uh, if the patient is having acute tubular necrosis, which means if you are going to subject the patient with uh, I mean, uh, uh, vasopressor support, it will terribly, sometimes it will harm the patient. So all these parameters to be ruled out when you are going to manage a patient with HRS. 
So the major measure always we need to eliminate the triggers, general measures if the patient are diuretic. So what is the basic definition? So the basic definition always you should remember that uh, is uh, cirrhosis with ascites and uh, there won't be any evidence of shock. There won't be any evidence of structural damage like uh, high proteinuria, microhematuria. And apart from that, if you're going to subject the patient with, uh, uh, I mean, there should not be any improvement in serum creatinine, at least after two days of diuretic withdrawal. And after that, once the patient been subjected with albumin support around one gram per kg to a maximum dose of around 100 grams per day, even after that, the serum creatinine going to improve for at least, uh, I mean, uh, not going to improve, which means uh, it shows evidence of HRS. And uh, the staging for HRS is nothing but stage one, two, three, and uh, based upon the creatinine values they've been taken into account. Uh, this is all theoretical purpose. And apart from that, the most important thing, so what is the main pathophysiology? Always you should remember the newer concept. This is very newer guidelines, 2020 guidelines, what we mentioned in that. <laughs> Once the portal hypertension or liver failure, if it is going to be there, the bacterial translocation process, PAM mediators, stall like receptor activation, immune response activation, all these things is going to be there. And multiple phenomena is there, reactive oxygen species and pro-inflammatory cytokine release, which will predispose to splanking and pulmonary artery vasodilatation and will lead you to inadequate cardiac output, which will predispose to multi-organ dysfunction like adrenal dysfunction, hepatic end curve, hepatopulmonary, and the patient can go for renal dysfunction. So the basic battery translocation because of PAMP, pathogen associated molecular pattern next to that because of dam damage as the pattern and all these things will be predisposing uh, with evidence of cytokine and other activities uh, to set this epitarinal syndrome pathophysiology along with multi-organ dysfunction. So the treatment is mainly we need to uh, categorize the patient because the most of the treatment guidelines initial as per the HRS 1 and 2 are being given in that. So we need to eliminate uh, so suppose if the patient is on diuretic, we need to stop the patient on diuretics, sometimes reduction of beta blockers and potential nephrotoxic to be avoided. And if the patient on diuretic, suppose if the, uh, we need to eliminate all the precipitating factors like severe diarrhea means we need to stop the lactose. And uh, we need to have, suppose if the patient is having more of blood loss means we need to target the blood transfusion. We need to assess by take and rotum assay rather than going for blood, I mean, uh, uh, other things, uh, septic workup. Sometimes what will happen always if the patient is having HRS, you should always remember that the rapid worsening of function in the background of, uh, uh, I mean, if the patient is having HRS, always you should remember there is some evidence of septicemia, uh, which is added over in this kind of complication. So always when you're going to treat a patient with HRS, the most important thing, we need to improve, we need to give a complete remission. So we need to give a complete response to therapy. So once you're given the complete response to therapy, the HRS has to improve and followed by, we can subject the patient for early liver transplant and other things. So the most important thing to be taken over, we need to improve, we need to show a significant response once you have been targeted the uh, patient with the uh, various therapies. So, so there are various therapies and the main things mainly for systemic vasoconstrictors like telepresin is having very potential role as we are well known and octetide and midodrine is uh, still more uh, mean to be considered and uh, along with renal vasodilators like other drugs no more in use nowadays and uh, tips placement can be tried along with com combination therapy with vasoconstrictors and tips can be tried and midodrine octetide and albumin, albumin infusion uh, can be tried, but uh, it doesn't show that rather than daily present in other groups and uh, not showing any significant benefit of improvement. See, in this uh, paper, what they've been taken into account, the daily present plus albumin, NORAD plus albumin, or octreotide plus midodrine plus albumin, they've been taken into account. So if you're going to use, they are going to see whether the patient is going to show no response or complete response or partial response. So complete response means the creatinine, if it is going to be less than 0.3 milligram per deciliter of the baseline serum creatinine. So, so all the daily patient is going to add, as we all know that there are three major pathways. One is by V1A, V2, V1B, and V2. So all, if your its main target is by V1A receptors of vascular smooth muscle, which will be, which will have to cause vasoconstriction in the systemic circulation as well as the splanchnic circulation. So as direct intrahepatic vessels that are reducing intrahepatic resistance to portal flow. So the reduction in portal flow definitely is having, which has a direct beneficial effect uh, in renal function in the background of cirrhosis. So the main important thing is by V1A. So also by V2, V1B, 
what is going sometimes having aldosterone like activity a steroid like activity apart from that b2 receptors what sometimes is going to do if some patients be when you are going to subject the patient with telepresence the v2 receptors will be acting collecting dark and this may predispose to hyponatremia and other complications so that's why we should remember that if the patient in the background of telepresence if you are going to subject some patients can develop hyponatremia that is mainly because of v2 receptor pathway that also to be taken into account we are going to manage to analyze all the spectrum in a proper manner there are multiple papers to quote that but how to assess the response to telepresence is always if the baseline cream creatinine if it is going to be more than five you should not use them I in the potential benefit of telepresence definitely is not going to be much and the bilirubin should be our target should be less than 10 and if the child book status based upon the various parameters it should be less than uh, 13 and low urine and gal values but value is not much defined so there are multiple papers to quote because we need to target the map more than five millimeter and our baseline bilirubin should be less than 10 millimeter, uh, I mean 10 milligrams per deciliter. And uh, these things has to be taken into account if you're going to uh, consider the patient for telepressin. So the dosage of telepressin, I'll be coming in upcoming slides. And uh, the, apart from that, there are other papers to quote for norepinephrine. Norepinephrine also to be equally effective in the management. But what's the problem is norepinephrine, the dose titration is difficult. Uh, multiple papers being tried because cost issues is definitely less when compared to adrenal. But uh, the cardiac arrhythmias and other complications will be there for noradrenaline and other things. But if you're going to use norad, if you need to give around 0.5 and we need to go up to 3 mg per hour, dose titration can be tried. And midodrine can be combined, but Midodrin, the main role, the problem is in HRS type 1, it's really, uh, I mean, uh, not much of use in uh, acute kidney disease. And apart from that, in type 2, uh, in the background of AKI, there is some questionable role for uh, uh, midodrin along with albumin support. But uh, still, uh, uh, more benefits, more paper as per Kevalin et al. What we mentioned that uh, and, uh, telepresent plus albumin is far superior to the combination of midodrine, octetrid, and albumin in terms of HRS1 reversal. So, uh, the generally present plus albumin is first line of choice rather than going for midodrine and octetrid in the management of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, acute kidney injury in the background of HRS. So, this is about the basic outline uh, which has been taken from the recent paper. So, stage one, AK, stage two, and stage three, as I've been discussed in my previous slide, we need to monitor the factors. We need to remove the nephrotoxic dust and we need to improve the plasma volume and we need to see whether the patient is having showing resolution of symptoms, whether the patient is stable or whether the patient is being worsening. So based upon that, in stage one, we need to decide. Stage two and three, diuretics, all the elimination along with albumin support around one gram per kg, assess the patient for response, see whether the patient is responding to HRS, I mean, I mean uh, whether the patient is responding to albumin and other support, whether the patient is fitting into the criteria of HRS and then we need to consider with telepresent and albumin support can be considered, but nothing works on. We need to look for other phenotypes like acute tubular necrosis, ATN, because vasopressor will arm the patient with ATN and other complications. Look for granular cause and other things, the separate area for discussion. So, and uh, in this, this is a outline about the management process where these things will be acting. Uh, see, if you're going to use albumin, it is going to act on cardiovascular dysfunction, cardiovascular dysfunction, and uh, the direction of effective intercalating volume, everything. These are the pathways uh, being inhibited uh, if you're going to use uh, albumin support. And if the patients, I mean, TIPS means evidence of portal hypertension, liver failure TIPS uh, is a bridge to therapy and liver transplant. And in the pathophysiology of splanking vasodilatation, there is a potential role for vasoconstrictors like telepresin can be considered. So the recommended dose, we can go start by 0.5 milligrams for telepresin, and we can even go up to a maximum of 12 milligrams. And uh, the initial bolus followed by two milligrams per day, we can titrate the dose and maximum of 12 milligrams per day, we can go around for a period of around 14 days, we can continue non-epinephrine as what I discussed with you. And midodrin, we can give by 7.5, or uh, five milligrams being tried. Octotide, if you're going to use under mics, initially followed by 50 mics uh, per hour can be considered if you're going to use octotide. So that shows with all these papers, what in this paper, what we mentioned that uh, if you're going to use a vasoconstrictor plus tips therapy, the 30 day survival and 90 day survival is going to be significantly better rather than going for a monotherapy. And before concluding, uh, about the area of management of refractory ascites, you should always remember midodrin is having a strong potential role in um, improving the MAP and diuretic responsiveness and better control of ascites and proper dose titration has to be done. 
And in PICD, always uh, scan use scanty data on using chelipresin and midodrine, but it shows uh, partly effective. But once a patient is going for HRS AKA, the first line of choice is always chelipresin plus albumin support. A second line could be non adrenaline plus albumin support, but the benefit effects of midodrine in HRS acute kidney injury is not much of a role. And HRS chronic kidney and HRS type 2, nothing but acute kidney and chronic kidney disease, and uh, chelipresin can be considered. The query in the form, the, potent, the benefit of midodrine in case of other HRS phenotypes can be considered, but these all need more papers to be validated. And finally, once a patient is going to set in for a stage three and four complications, the renal replacement therapy, like uh, multiple other modalities, like slow continuous renal, I mean, I mean, renal I mean, uh, cuff and uh, slow low efficient dialysis, uh, continue venous venous dialysis, so much of modalities of renal replacement therapy. But the problem is when to initiate renal replacement therapy, to whom you subject the renal replacement therapy, how to titrate the dose, I mean, how to titrate, when to stop the renal replacement therapy, how long to give the renal, so those are all the major still confounding factors to be uh, proven if you're going to subject the patient for RRT. So if nothing works on, consider the patient early and go for liver transplant as early as possible. Uh, in, if the patient is going to present with uh, moderate ascites, you can go for tips at the earlier presentation as for the latest treatment and uh, control the ascites with salt and diuretic, I mean, uh, diuretics as well as salt restriction along with take care of the refractory ascites and prevent the complication of HRS. Consider the patient for early liver transplant to overcome all these complications in a successful manner. With this, I would like to rest my presentation and thanking you all for patient listening. And I'm happy to take over questions if you have anything is there to tell me. Thank you very much. So you can, uh, uh, Doctor Arun, that was a very comprehensive and uh, excellent uh, presentation. You have covered almost you, all the papers in this uh, field. So there is nothing, uh, uh, um, nothing much left to be said anymore. But uh, uh, um, it, uh, I, I think the important take home message is that uh, uh, midodrine is an option for treatment in patients with hepatorenal syndrome, especially when there is a low mean arterial pressure or coexisting hyponatremia. So these yep. are the settings where midodrine has some unique uh, uh, properties over the other uh, uh, molecules. At the same time, uh, the standard of care is terlipresin with uh, albumin as uh, uh, there is only one uh, direct randomized uh, trial comparing midodrine uh, with octreotide and albumin versus terlipresin with albumin. So, in th this is a, this was a small study only. Dr. Arun has uh, already listed it here, but that is a direct uh, randomized controlled trial which uh, um, uh, uh, tested whether uh, the uh, uh, established practice of uh, albumin plus terlipresin is uh, uh, better or midodrine could be a uh, an efficient alternative. So this study size was not sufficient to uh, give a conclusion in this matter. But as of now, the standard practice is terlipresin plus albumin that scores over the uh, midodrine al alternative al along with the octreotide and albumin. So these are the key take home uh, messages Dr. Arun Stock has given us. So. Uh, um, if there are any questions, you may uh, ask, uh, Doctor. I think Arun, uh, Arun, sir, like if you close the slides, then uh, we all can be seen on the screen actually. So you want me to close the slides, sir? Ha, uh, slides, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you able to see me, sir? Uh, like uh, we can't see you, sir. So I can ask a question to Dr. Arun, uh, whether uh, uh, how uh, often we uh, start midotrin and what is the usual starting dose? So, so thank you for your nice question, sir. So the most important thing, uh, see, when the patient been diagnosed with the evidence of refractory acid, because uh, as we all know that, if you want to label a patient with refractory acid, it's uh, the most important thing, the definition, what they may mention in that, over a period of time, even with the large volume parasitism and maximum diuretic support. 
like 160 milligram of flusamide and 400 milligrams of spinal electron. And I'm very sure that we are not going to subject this kind of maximum dose to many patients. Because if you're going to subject this kind of maximum dose, definitely there is high possibility for the patient to land up in other complications like diuretic intractable complications, or diuretic resistant complications can supervene. So to prevent this, once a patient is not showing any response, even with the mild to moderate dose, if the patients, we need to target the map, or it should be, suppose if the patient's map is around 50 to 60, we need to target a map achievement of more than around 65 to 70. So that's the most important thing so for which we can consider uh, to start with uh, a parasynthesis along with albumin sub, I mean, a midodrine support. So in this background, if you're going to start a midodrine, uh, we can start at least around set up uh, multiple drugs. Many farmers have been there. Unitro has been taken over in the field. So 2.5, 5 milligrams. But in my experience, I'll be going only approximately around 5 milligrams thrice daily. And sometimes I have been subjected to some patients even up to 12.5 milligrams, but usually we'll be giving around 5 milligrams thrice daily to our serial title monitoring based upon the map and other parameters, based upon the clinical picture, how the patient is going to respond to that. So slowly we'll be titrating a dose of 2.5 milligram escalating and uh, this thing regimen can be tried over, sir. But some papers have been quoted around 17.5 milligrams also, but we are not going up to that. So our experience in our center around uh, 5 milligrams tedious, or sometimes we'll be going maximum of 2, uh, 10, I mean, uh, 7 to 10 milligrams. Most of the time before that, we'll be considering the patient. And the duration can be uh, usually for months, around the three months of patients we were given for six months. And even some patients, papers have reported that even up to one year, some papers are there to prove that even up to 1.5 to 1 years as a bridge to therapy can be considered. But as early as uh, transplantation has to be considered in these kind of patients. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Arun, there, is, uh, there are some questions in the chat window. There is a query from Dr. Srikanth. Uh, which uh, 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 his, uh, uh, he, want, uh, he wishes to know uh, the comparative efficacy of midodrin in HRS type 1 versus type 2 and uh, whether there are any serious adverse events with midodrin. The, the efficacy of HRS type 1 and type 2, now the definition has completely gone, sir. So the HRS type oh. 1 is rather by HRS AKA and now it's been taken over by type 2 by HRS non-AKA. But in type 1, HRS type 1, what have we mentioned if the creatinine is going to be more than 2.5 and if it is going to be more than 1.5 in type 2. So type 1, the role of midodrain is definitely it's questionable. It's not much of role, sir. And type 2, if the patient can be subjected for midodrain, but along with the lipids and others supposed to be added. But type 2, the query beneficial effects is minimal. But type 1, there is no significant benefit for midodrain. Sir. Okay. Yeah, that's... Uh, uh... That's a nice answer, uh, Dr. Arun. There is another question from Dr. Uh, Kannan, who is a diabetologist from Chennai. So uh, his uh, question is uh, about uh, diabetes and uh, uh, cirrhotic patients and their predisposition for uh, HRS. That is one question. Another question is, uh, which is more challenging in the management? Is type 1 or type 2? So I, uh, I directed. Always type 1 is more challenging in the management. It's very obvious because uh, we having acute kidney injury. So it's more challenging. And next to that, if you're going to look in the background of cirrhosis, the diabetes, uh, the hepatic impairment will be around 80 to 90 percent of the patients will be having uh, a glucose output impairment definitely is going to be there, sir. So apart from that, how many percentage of patients in the background of this, I mean, uh, uh, I mean um, insulin resistance, how many percentage of the patients can go for diabetes will be around 30% uh, of the population in the background of cirrhosis can be reported. So usually, if the patient is having coexisting complications like diabetes, hypothyroid, or the patient is hypertensive, so the possibility of response, the worsening of scenario will be slightly, will be still more high in this kind of background. And diabetes in the background of NAFLD is more difficult to treat. And always we need to eliminate the triggering factors like B, C, alcohol. Alcohol is definitely reasonably easier than all these things to be tackled over. Okay. So HRS1 has higher mortality and is a, has a much uh, progressive much course. Personal. Actually, we uh, have dealt with more um, refractory ascites, which comes in the context of context of uh, HRS uh, type two. I mean, this is the SPL HRS one and two. So sure. uh, uh, this talk actually and the context of midodrine is more in the uh, type two HRS. 
So, uh, um, I think that's the end of questions. If any other questions are there from the floor, we can take it. Arun sir, video is not coming. It's not on. Video is not coming, sir. Ah, uh, your uh, video is looking off. Sir, matlab off in essence, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I'm not very sure, sir, but uh, I didn't stop my video yet. Actually, sir, like, matlab, okay, we are from like a mainstream layman thing. Uh, definitely, matlab, patient will come with the clinical symptoms. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe patient wants to test serum creatine or other things. You can find out uh, in the particular indication. Uh, apart from this, doctor, like, matlab, uh, many city patients, okay, they are educated and uh, they can get through uh, the. Uh, they have got a lot of. Uh, they are more. Uh, uh blessed to get uh, identified and get treated with the testing but people who stay in remote areas or were not being uh, gone to diagnostic test, what are the clinical symptoms you can see with this we can feel uh, yes this is might be a uh, ra patient or this might be a hrs patient uh, like that so is there anything doctor by which we can find out that uh, just by have a clinical symptoms or by looks or we can uh, uh, come to a conclusion that yes then we can suggest the identify the patient so that can Prevention is better than cure because there are many patients who suffer with medication and they turn back to the doctor maybe in the uh, maybe maybe in the last week uh, so that uh, the disease progression could be very high. So my my uh, question is: Is there any clinical symptoms where we can identify patient or refractory ascites uh, or HRS uh, by just uh, having? Uh, then we can go for a uh, uh, diagnostics and all the testings. Of course, uh, actually, uh, even if the patient is periphery or non-periphery, it doesn't mind going to make any major change. But based upon the etiological factor in whom the patient is going to present, and based upon other multiple parameters to be taken into account, suppose if the patient is having age criteria, some patients will be having female, will be having more versatile outcome, and some patient will be having less than 40, uh, kg of weight, and some patients will be having coexisting comorbidities and complications like diabetes, hypertension. Obesity and thyroid and other disorders. All these parameters has to be taken into account. Once a patient been subjected to initial salt restriction and sodium and sodium restriction along with uh, diuretic support of the first line of care. In this, we need to improve the. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, good. We need to show the patient with good response to therapy, which means the patient, uh, the patient has to have a reduction of weight at least of 0.5 grams per day, 0.5 kg per day has to be improved, along with the urinary spot and sodium potassium has to be improved, and all these things has to be taken into account before labeling the patient as refractory as it is. But HRS, even with mild impairment, you should not take as HRS. But usually, in the background of chronic kidney disease, the creatinine value will be over around four or five like that. So usually, in our management, the role of Middle range, other things when you are going to set in. So usually it will be in the range of 1.5 to 1.8, or maximum of two. So when you are going to subject the patient with this kind of pathology, we can uh, identify whether the patient is having refractory ascites or HRS. So if you want to label the patient as HRS, you need to do a imaging, and we need to be able to look for evidence of structural etiology, structural focus like urinary analysis and proteinuria, other measurement. And imaging should not show any evidence of organ injury. Our imaging should not show any evidence of cortical scarring and other things. So all these things has to be taken to label the patient as HRS without evidence of shock. There are multiple definitions for that. And refractory acid is if the patient is not going to improve even at the maximum dose of diuretic with the uh, salt restriction. If the patient is going to worsen, that shows clear evidence of refractory acid is. But these two entities is a more major complications to be analyzed properly before subjecting the patient for liver transplantation. Dr. Arun, there are a couple of questions more. One is whether midodrin increases the risk of variceal bleeding. So, any comments? So, so there is possibility for, uh, but there are not much of papers for midodrin to increase the risk of variceal bleed. But provided that if the patient is having a HVPG measurement, if it is going to be more than 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury, and if the patient is not going to have any much of decompensated, if the patient is not much of evidence of uh, refractory acid, is we are not going to subject the patient with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, midodrin. And but there are some papers being quoted. There is some evidence to his history of worsening of uh, because there is some evidence. Of ischemic events can happen, and there is some evidence of variceal bleed to supervein. But we need still more papers to quote this presentation, sir. Okay, and there is one last question here, which is uh, indication for uh, renal replacement therapy dialysis in uh, uh, HRS. But I so, guess, that is, yeah. Already we have been discussed in a paper. Renal replacement therapy is one final modality once the patient is going for stage three and four AKI. 
So once the patient is going for stage three, which means the complete worsening of renal function, renal shutdown, there is high possibility for you to go for renal replacement. But in this, if you are going to look into ILBS statement, various papers, what they've been quoted about, how is the dose, how long you are going to give, what is the thing, what is the modality of treatment, whether you are going to use cuff or sled, uh, anything, what is the modality of treatment you are going to use. These are all still we need to be, we need we, our data is still more or less if you are going to use uh, a renal replacement therapy to be analyzed in the proper manner. Yeah, the indications of uh, renal replacement therapy uh, remains the same, even in the context of uh, HRS. So if there is a need uh, uh, felt by the nephrologist, uh, we generally go ahead with it. There are, I mean, there are no contraindications uh, or uh, special uh, uh, issues. Uh, if the um, dialysis is required, I mean, to advise against it, only uh, the context may be uh, a low pressure which may uh, 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 make us select a modality uh, uh, which can maintain the patient's mean arterial pressure. Sure. Any other so, questions to take also? Mm, yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, all the questions have been uh, addressed, uh, Dr. Arun. That was an excellent presentation and an interactive discussion from the floor. So, thank you, Arun, sir, and thank you, Dr. Ting, okay. sir, to join the session. And without you, uh, it will not be possible, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Actually, it was a very brainstorming session, what I feel, because last week we had a medical presentation uh, when we launched our Midodrin, our Midohep. And uh, I was just going through the way our presenting was like a uh, refresh for my knowledge, actually. And I think this uh, uh, RA and HRS, I think, has a huge patient population across the country. And uh, maybe this medicine can be a blessing uh, for those patients to. Uh, come back to normalcy and uh, they can uh, have a better quality of life. And, but we uh, want... But so the one thing I want to share with you also before switching over, because there are so many farmers that have been coming with middle rate. Initially, the cost was very high, but I'm expecting the cost has to be slightly low for which we can subject the patient. We can go for multiple trials and uh, it's very easy to for even the patients to buy over that. So uh, you need to consider, uh, I mean, refining the cost and other issues to be considered. So. Definitely, sir. Petro being, I think, blessing manufacturer, uh, patient friendly. Uh, we'll be at, the, at our best to keep that uh, thing in place and uh, uh, maximum patients will get benefit with our medical health, actually. And uh, yeah, yes, sir. Arun, sir, anything else? Uh, no, nothing more to add. So, really, it was a great evening, uh, a great show. And really, uh, I, I want to <laughs> salute you, sir, for the uh, excellent moderatorship. And uh, Arun, sir, the way you presented, uh, it was a fantastic. Uh, uh, presentation across. I really thank you, uh, Dr. R.S. Arun, sir, for being a moderator for the evening and uh, uh, taking the webinar to the next level. And Dr. N. Arun, sir, uh, really it's uh, a lot of uh, in-depth knowledge. <laughs> so we, we meet several times. Uh, first time I'm seeing you in, uh, although I see a lot of your uh, videos uh, in uh, with their different subjects, but this is something great. And I really thank you very, very much for being with us in this evening. And uh, apart from this, uh, sir, behind the scene, uh, we, we have a marketing team. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Nehru, sir, for being all the support. Our marketing team, Ms. Swetha, Aditi, uh, Lakshmi, Akshay, and Kanan. And our IT team in Hyderabad, uh, Mr. Bharat. Uh, we all thank, thank you all for being there for this program. And I wish uh, we have a lot of things in role, sir. Uh, coming weeks, we come with more exciting, uh, more better topic, uh, more good topics and uh, new formulations, and new uh, experiences. And different, I would like to uh, get your blessings for forthcoming events and programs also and look forward to associating coming days. Thank you very much for being here, sir. Have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Arun, sir, and thank you all yeah. the participants and thank you, team and true. Happy you, weekend. Uh, despite weekend, you were all here. Really uh, great. Thank you very much, sir. And thank, you, sir. thank you, sir. Thank you, all. Good, good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.